The following presentation was recorded at the 2014 Southeast Linux Fest in Charlotte, North Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following diamond sponsors in 2014 for helping make these videos possible. All right, so welcome to the 2014 Southeast Linux Fest. Uh, I am pleased to announce that uh, just as it has been in every year past, uh, supporting attendees have outgiven our largest sponsor yet again. So give yourself a round of applause. Uh, we will have a raffle a little later on uh, in the evening right after the closing keynote in this room. At some point out in the expo hall there will be a, a little quick anonymous info survey kind of thing where you can get a raffle for, ticket for that. Um, not up yet, just sort of keep looking around for it in the hall, it'll appear eventually. Um, I'm pleased to introduce sort of the, if you haven't met Alan before, if the hat hasn't given it away and the swaggerisms and the accent, uh, Alan Hicks, you may at least recognize his voice as the voiceover for all of our videos and audio we release. Uh, uh, Alan hails from the yet unrecognized uh, Republic of Georgia, which has in fact seceded, you just don't know it yet. <laughs> And uh, he's an all-around good guy and helps a lot with the conference behind the scenes. So if you see him in the bar, buy him a beer uh, if he isn't already double fisting. Uh, so without any further ado, Alan Hicks. D don't let the double fisting stop you. <laughs> uh, so here we are, maintaining privacy in the digital age. Uh, I just wrote up there, who am I and why do I care, but Jeremy just told you, uh, if you weren't paying attention then, you're not going to get it again. So why does this matter? Uh, we have so many people thinking about, uh, I mean, how much of our lives is online now compared to five years ago or ten years ago? I mean, 10 years ago, 2004, we have so very little. And then you go back another five years before that, and you're into 1999, and September 11th won't happen for two more years, and no one is thinking about anything. And really, the people, for the most part, don't think about these things today. So with all the various... Uh, things that have come down in the past year, it's, it's something that we need to at least have a public discussion about, even if we don't agree on what should be done or even what is currently being done. Uh, we should at least discuss this openly and see if we can't get to some sort of solutions. Uh, and what can we do about it? That's the solution part. And unfortunately, the answer is sometimes not a whole lot and sometimes it's you know a, a little more and then sometimes it depends upon whether we're acting as individuals or if we're acting as groups uh, I'm gonna try and keep the politics as far out of this as possible but you know this is by its nature given what's been going on the last year somewhat a political discussion but you may or may not agree with me so I'm gonna try and keep my personal things out of it and when I do get to that I'll point it out as much as I can. So let's move right in and uh, get started with, hey, I've already gone over that so I won't go over it again. Jeremy did that good enough. So why does your digital privacy matter? And the unfortunate answer is because we all have something to hide. Is there anybody here, raise your hand, who does not have something to hide? Liar. <laughs> Uh, the next statement is, is part of my uh, personal beliefs because we are sovereign individuals with an inherent human right to own our personal information and that sovereign individuals is the thing where you're going to get into some political stuff with me because I view rights as a, an innate part of the human condition that should not be taken away for really any, good, any reason or at least without a really good one. Uh, because the information is power. Uh, I'm just going to let that one stand for itself. Uh, if you disagree with that, fine, go get your sword, I'll get my pen. Uh, 
Because power is always eventually abused. That's another one of my personal political things, I guess, but I think history bears me out on that, and I think anyone who studies will agree that we human beings can be pretty doggone awful when we're given control over other folks. Uh, and because anonymity frees people to act in ways that are sometimes necessary and or unacceptable to others, that might be perhaps the most controversial statement here. You know, people think, uh, you always hear, well, I don't have anything to hide. And let's, let's assume, you know, that you actually believe you don't have something to hide. There are times when, uh, you know, good people do things that are clearly against the law. Uh, great example, and this is almost a Godwin situation here. Uh, you look at someone like Harriet Tubman, for instance. Breaking the law, 100%, for all the right reasons. You know, the law itself is not always correct, it is not always moral. It is, you know, sometimes legal criminal activity, or at least legal immoral activity. So, being anonymous, or at least being a little bit more secure in our persons, allows us a little bit more freedom of uh, action in these sorts of things. So what can we do about these things? That is the $64,000 question, and if you do not remember the $64,000 pyramid, you're even older than I am. Um, at a group level, options are kind of limited. These sort of things, that they require political change and probably cultural change. I'm reminded of uh, uh, Bruce Snyder, brilliant fella, and I probably just butchered his name. Uh, he was talking about in his cryptogram uh, thing about the full body scanners at airports. Everybody remember the controversy when all that stuff was going through? And he said something along the lines of, this is what's going to get the American people to rebel against these encroaching freedoms and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, people are going to be taking, you know, snapshots of them without their clothes on every time they try and board a plane. And there's going to be pat downs and stuff. And what we really found out is that the American people will roll over and take it. Uh, for the most part, it's just the way it is. And if we want to change that, that probably is going to require some sort of cultural change. At the individual level though, because we don't have to band together with other people, we don't have to form any sort of consensus, we can just act unilaterally. We have more freedom to do things that will not necessarily protect all of us, but can protect ourselves. Um, and finally, you know, just knowing what threats exist in power, us remember, go back to knowledge is power and the more we learn the better equipped we are to face reality on its own terms and to come up with some sort of decent solution. So I kind of break the, the types of threats down into three groups and uh, see how fast I'm going here because I'm probably oh yeah I'm going mighty fast good. We have a uh, data mongers. Everybody's heard the term iron mongers. These are people who make, you know, uh, missiles and guns and stuff for the military. You know, they're war mongers or iron mongers. Data mongers, they don't make iron, they make data. Or at least collect it, gather it, farm it. Then we have uh, middlemen. These are the people who sort of sit in the middle and you've got your intelligence services. And I'll get to them more in a moment. But your data mongers, these are predominantly things like social media and online service providers. Uh, things like Gmail, Facebook, uh, blah, blah, blah. And their business plan revolves at least partially around gathering data on you and doing something with that data. Uh, the benign cases are to serve ads tailored to you. Uh, if anybody ever watches This Week in Tech or listen to it, you know, there was like a couple, two or three weeks ago, Larry Laporte was on there and they were talking about this and he came along the line of, I, I, don't, I don't care how much Amazon or how much Google knows about me, they're just using this to serve ads tailored to me. 
if I'm, you know, buying a lot of gardening supplies, I'm more interested in seeing an advertisement about a fertilizer than I am about, I don't know, a car or something. But there are more malignant cases that even if they aren't going on now, you can easily imagine happening in the future. Uh, these were the data company is uh, set up to essentially sell information about you to other people who may or may not be as benign about it. Then we've got middlemen, and these people know more about you than anybody else if they care to learn. These are things like your ISP, your wireless carrier, these sorts of things. They, uh, their business plan is to provide you access to content, to uh, facilitate you getting whatever it is you want. Since they facilitate that transaction, they essentially see it all, or at least see that something's going on. And since they facilitate all these things, they potentially know more about you and your habits than anybody else. Uh, it's easy to see how Facebook knows some stuff about you that you stick on Facebook. It's easy to see how Google knows something you do uh, when you go to Google. Now this has gotten better because these services are encrypted now, but uh, you know, just for argument's sake, let's say that's all sent in plain text. Facebook has its world over here and Google has its world over here. But in the middle you have your ISP who is facilitating both things and they see all of it. Um, since their business plan, at least ostensibly <coughs> Comcast, revolves around providing access to content, you know, they, they might not be interested in selling your data but they almost certainly have data of interest to other people. And we see this, you know, with things like uh, the NSA or some other government agency going to, say, AT&T, Verizon or something, saying, we want to tap on these pipes because that data is of interest to those organizations for whatever reason, right or wrong, legitimate, illegitimate, not going to get into that debate. Just saying, you know, they certainly have access to it. So even if they're not actively an enemy, you need to at least treat them, I guess, as a suspicious character. And finally, we have our intelligence services. These are, you know, NSA, CIA, FBI, MI6, FIS. If you don't know what that is, that's the KGB successor, uh, Israel's Mossad. Everybody's got one or two or three of them. Uh, sometimes more. Ostensibly, they're, you know, there to protect you against violence, foreign and domestic. You know, we're protecting you against terrorists. Blah blah blah. Uh, you know, that's the line. But they probably don't have your best interest in mind. And if you don't believe me, ask Angela Merkel. Uh, <coughs> if you don't know who that is, that's Germany's prime minister. Germany is this country that's on the other side of a great big salt pond. <laughs> Uh, and uh, NSA apparently, you know, tapped her phone, or maybe it was CIA or whatever, because, you know, they wanted to spy on her for whatever reason. So even if you trust your own country's agencies, even if you trust, you know, the NSA to, uh, you know, we're, we're protecting you from terrorists. We're just, you know, throwing out the fishing net, the drag net. And we're, we're looking for, you know, the, the next Osama bin Laden, the next Timothy McVeigh. Uh, whose name never gets mentioned anymore. Uh, we're looking for the next uh, Sarnai of Brothers. Can you say the same thing about the Russian FIS if they're looking at your data? Are they looking at it for the same reason? What about North Korea's? Uh, they're a great boogeyman. Iran, you know. Are their uh, you know, intelligence services looking at the same thing for those same reasons? Well, probably not, because they're different political entities with different political motivations. So even if you can trust your own or your allies like MI6, you can't trust them all. And we have to operate under the assumption that if our government can do it today, other governments can at least do it tomorrow. 
you know they might not you know have the funding quite the access and stuff today but if they don't they've got to be catching up pretty quick you would think I mean that's only logical technology always gets better uh, attacks always get better they don't get worse uh, that's sort of a truism of technology and period so we have to treat them as hostile services simply because you know what we said and even if you do trust yours today can you say that you'll trust them tomorrow and there there are plenty of uh, of uh, examples where you've got good people who are being targeted even in this country by their own domestic services like uh, uh, J. Edgar Hoover's FBI targeting uh, Martin Luther King Jr. and doing all kinds of nice things like creating a sex tape of him and then you know hanging it over his head to say we're gonna send this to your wife if you don't you know stop being uppity and things like that it's not that difficult today to see that same sort of thing happening again especially given you know we torture people and things so that's basically a step down so given these three types of threats what can we do about it and at the public level as far as I see the answer is not much the problem is like I said earlier when we were talking about the uh, full body scanners and airport pat downs and stuff we find out that a huge portion of the American people just roll over and take it uh, and that's quite unfortunate in my opinion uh, any sort of progress at the political level at the public level it's going to take some sort of concerted grassroots because at even in, in the political level they make some sort of brouhaha and you know they, they sit around harumphing you know you, you can see a bunch of Republicans and Democrats up in Congress going harumph, harumph, harumph can't you about this in order to appeal to their constituents who are concerned about it and then they do diddly squat uh, so that the ideal sort of legislation I would like to see is some sort of ideally a constitutionally protected human right but uh, this is a little bit tricky and I don't know exactly how it could work out entirely because I'm only one man I'm not you know the most gifted person in the world uh, but some sort of law that would grant individuals ownership and control over their personal information something like we've all clicked on EULAs right is there anybody here who has never clicked on a EULA is there anybody in here who's ever read one <laughs> liars <laughs> <say all>, <laughs> but uh something where the EULA is not just a contract of you have to do this and we can do this and this and this and this and this and this and this, and this. but something like okay Facebook I'm providing you with a certain amount of public data you're contractually bound to do only these sorts of things with this data and you know go from there the, the issue is and we'll get into that in a minute who actually owns that data uh, and that's a blurry area even if you say you own your own because we have people who you know info about me might also say something about y'all uh, so I don't see this happening at least from the political level because like I wrote here you've got combined forces of businesses you've got political interest you've got an entrenched uh, you know uh, game in the spy business if that's what you want to call it and they're not going to be you know they're not every government program or activity or something has people that benefit from it and they will fight tooth and nail from for it and this is a pretty large seg large uh, segment of of things and there are a lot of interested people who want to keep things the way they are and will do you know pretty much whatever it takes to to see that happen there aren't that many powerful people 
who are all that interested in sharing power or giving any of it up. So, you know, I don't see anything other than a concerted grassroots. And unfortunately, due to the way that the American people sort of roll over for things, I don't see that happening either. So we're pretty much left with individual solutions, which fortunately things are a little bit better here. There's no great panacea at this level. Uh, you can have a very secure digital persona, I suppose you would say. Uh, if you never get online, you know, if you cut yourself off, and, and even then it's not 100%, but you know, you can have some control over this simply because of, you know, you, if you can control yourself, and that's, that's the hardest part, especially for us Americans, control ourselves, uh, that, that sounds communist, uh, you know, that's anti-American. But uh, since we don't have control over information others acquire about us, uh, we do have control over what personal information hasn't yet been divulged. So uh, this is sort of what I was talking about in the gray area. Something about me might uh, tell uh, something about you, and I'll get to that in a moment. Uh, each one of us as individuals, we have to decide how important our privacy is and how far we're willing to take it. So I take it to a certain level and there are people who take it further than me. And there are a lot of people who don't take it nearly as far as I do. And I tend to look down on people who don't take it at least as far as I do, but I don't really have a right to. Provided that they have looked at this intelligently, thought about this, rationally said, this is as far as I'm willing to go. I like this convenience, I like these services, I like you know, this, that, and the other, uh, and I'm not willing to give that up. I'm willing to trade some of my personal information, some of my privacy. I'm willing to be a little bit more, less anonymous, a little bit more open with my life in exchange for certain things. And as long as they've made that rational choice, I don't really have the right to tell them that they have chosen wrong, I guess, because what's right for them might not be right for me and vice versa. So what can we do against the data mongers? These are, you know, Facebook, uh, Google, blah, blah, blah. And I'm running a lot faster than I want to. So if anybody wants to slow me down, you can raise your hand and ask a question. But uh, abstinence, I'm going to sound like a Talabaptist here. Abstinence is the 100% most effective solution if we're willing to commit to it. Uh, we have the same problem with abstinence online that we have with teenage sex. It does not work because people are not willing to do it. Uh, you know, you can easily say if you cut yourself completely off, you don't have anything to worry about. And I suppose at least to some extent that's true, but then you're cut off from everything. And that's not necessarily the best thing to do either. Um, for pity's sake, at, at least when you see one of those stay logged in buttons anywhere you are, uncheck that darn thing. You know, ditch those cookies, don't stay logged into the sites, don't, you know, have that flying around, sending data everywhere. You know, that's the very least you can do is to type your password in every so often. Come on. Uh, while total abstinence ain't really acceptable, partial abstinence is a little bit more palatable. I think I got a little bit more here on social media. This is uh, perhaps the second greatest spy tool in the world. I'll get to the first towards the end of the slide, or end of the presentation, but social media, you either have to get off of it or you have to be extremely strict. And even when you're extremely strict about what you put up there, it's not perfect. Let's give an example of uh, a married man who's having an affair. Uh, you can throw your you know, moral judgments or whatever. Just, just put that to the side for a moment. I think we can all agree he has a vested interest in keeping his wife from knowing about that. So let's say he you know, goes into his 
Um, honey, I've got a business trip this weekend. We're flying up to, uh, you know, L.A. or something. We've got uh, a bunch going on, and I'm going to be, you know, I'm, I'm going to be busy all weekend. Love you. Kiss on the cheek. Bye. And he goes out, he drives to the airport, and he meets his mistress there, and they go to Myrtle Beach. And they spend, you know, the whole weekend there. And she takes some pictures of them, you know, on the beach, you know, laughing, having fun, uh, and posts them on Facebook. And someone comes along and tags the husband's name on that picture. And then, you know, a week later, his wife goes online and, oh, hey, here's something on your wall. Now, he did not put any of that information up there. Someone else put that information about him up there. And since he had even an account, they were able to tag it to that account. She was friends. She, you know, got to see these things. And, you know, through him not even taking any action other than, you know, having an affair, his wife was able to find out about it through Facebook, even though he may not have even logged into it for years. So you can see why even, you know, if, even if we have an account, we're not, and, and we're not putting information about us up there, it's easy for other people to put information about us there. Yes, sir? Okay, so the question is, uh, you're in a public space, what's the difference between uh, that and somebody's friend of a friend coming by recognizing him and telling his wife? Uh, that's a good question. The, the, the fact that you're in a public space, you know, is probably a bad thing. Let's say she took some pictures of them in their motel room, getting it on. Okay, so the question was, who would post that to Facebook? <laughs> the answer is not something I'm at liberty to share. <laughs> I mean, this is about digital privacy. I will have to, you know, th this is going on YouTube with my name attached to it. There are some things I will not say. <laughs> But uh, so, you know, see, even with uh, strict discipline, uh, it's not 100% effective. What just. Uh, uh, one thing I do think is worth pointing out is that somebody doesn't even necessarily have to decide on their own to tag that person. Every person who sees them is going to be begged by Facebook hey, do you want to tag Joe with last name? Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, his uh, comment you're a good man. I don't care what others say about you. <laughs> So his comment was uh, that, you know, they, they put this thing up there and they don't even necessarily have to tag it, but Facebook is going to pester everyone who looks at that to tag the people in there. Uh, yes? Uh, going down the Facebook rabbit hole, if you ever have read their user agreement, uh, you don't own your pictures anymore when you put them on Facebook. So the dirty mistress pictures could get posted on Facebook. Facebook now owns that picture and can make the dirty mistress Myrtle Beach bikini calendar own it, sell it, and never inform her of that. So I think the question is where can I obtain this calendar? Oh. <laughs> uh, did, I, I'm assuming since you had the mic, we got that question good? Okay. Uh, anybody else want to say something that I can joke on? Uh, okay, one more before we move on. Not that you can joke on, but I, I think the, the key factor here is intent. So Facebook allows a lot of unintended consequences. Like, you know, Facebook allows you to take pictures Okay, so uh, I'm not sure how much of that we got, but he was making a statement where uh, going further down the Facebook rabbit hole here, uh, you've got an issue of 
there's some sort of intent involved here and you know taking the cheating spouse metaphor uh, you know a little bit further is that he could be unintentionally ratted out by a friend who doesn't even necessarily know that this is going on and, and this that and the other it doesn't have to be a malicious thing uh, one one last one then we'll move on to the next slide Y'all get that uh, question good? Okay. Uh, what he said. Uh, <laughs> basically what he was saying is, is he attended a talk, someone else was giving a presentation about how, I, I guess the way I should put it is we have different faces. You know, you are a, a different person to your mom than you are to your grandmama. You're a different person to those two than you are to your best friend. You're a different person to those three than you are to your boss. And that we sort of, I guess, behave differently somewhat based on the situation or based on the relationships we have to other people. And that social media kind of tears all that away because anytime we post something with our friend, you know, it can be in one context where you know, we're, we're goofing around, having a good time, and we're being sarcastic or something. Uh, and it goes out to everyone that way, but it isn't read that way by everyone because everyone else, you know, your grandmother's relationship is fundamentally different from that of your friends. And yet, she's receiving this data as if she was the friend you originally had it with. And there's a lot of... I wouldn't necessarily say miscommunication because it was never really intended to be communicated that way to begin with. Uh, but there's a lot of misunderstanding, I guess, at best. So, a little bit further. I really do appreciate the good questions and comments, though, because that's the only way we're going to make it to 10 o'clock. <laughs> so, against service providers, thank God we don't have to cut ourselves completely off. Uh, you know, ISPs, things like that. We don't have to cut ourselves off completely. Uh, if we did, you would never be able to see this YouTube presentation when it, you know, hits. Often it's enough to just limit use to uh, certain areas. You know, example, we got uh, an email account you only use for spam. You know, we've got our Gmail account for, you know, ahicspam at gmail.com and you sign up for every little thing that you don't ever want to get an email from and it goes there to die. It's sort of the email bit bucket. And yes, it tells a certain amount about you, but it isn't tied to your Facebook account. You used a different email address there. It isn't tied to the rest of the stuff you do on Google. You use different accounts there for Google Plus. Does anybody here actually use Google Plus? Bunch of liars. <laughs> you might have an account, but you don't use it. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah, there you go. But, uh, you know, you, you, can, you can sort of partition things up and each, each service provider, whether it's social media, whether it's... Uh, uh, an, an online email account, whether it's an online uh, web service. Uh, something like Linode is a service provider. Uh, we don't necessarily think of it that way, but Linode's a service provider. They're offering you a service of a uh, virtual machine or a container of some kind. I, it's been some time since I've looked at Linode, so I wouldn't know. But, uh, or I don't know the specifics, but because you can partition things out and you can select what each one sees at least then you have you know it, it's easy to still use these things 
and no one really has a, co a clear, complete picture. You can almost treat them like a business relationship in some ways. Uh, I, I do all these things here, and, and that's it. And yes, sir. So uh, his comment was, let's say even with like Linode, who has your best interest at heart, let's say they actually do. I don't know. I don't know the good people at Linode. I'm sure they're excellent. They're a sponsor, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so you know, even if you trust them and you trust your ISP, you've got all these other ISPs that are in the way that are you know connected between you. You've got level three carriers and. Blah, 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 and they don't necessarily have your best interest at heart. I would take this a little bit further and say you're dealing with a, a business entity which may come and go, and even if it stays forever, it's certainly going to change management and probably is going to change hands at some point in the future. So if they have your best interest at heart today, there ain't no guarantee they're going to have your best interest at heart tomorrow. Uh, or the year after that. You know, things change over time, but data is permanent. That's why they have data retention guidelines. So they only keep your data 60 days or 90 days or something. So you only get 90 days of data if you buy it. Okay, thanks. That was a great comment. Uh, and I'm assuming that's specific to Linode. No, most of them have that kind of thing. Okay. Well, he was talking about, you know, data retention guidelines where, you know, they only keep data for 60 days, 90 days, whatever. Uh, yes, ma'am. I guess um, within that 60 days is when all the identity theft occurs for people's bank accounts. <laughs> yeah, and it's a difficult thing to say. I mean, we, we all see those these big identity theft sort of things where, you know, Target gets attacked and there's, you know, half a million or several million credit cards that are being compromised. And, but the majority of the time when we find that there's a, uh, a, a major identity theft thing, it's somebody took a work laptop home and it went missing. You know, it was either lost or stolen or something. And then you suddenly see, you know, millions of letters being sent out saying, you know, some of this stuff may have been misplaced and we're offering you free identity theft protection for a year for $10 a month normally, but we're going to waive that and cover it for you. It's, it's generally those sort of situations more than, uh, than, you know, like being hacked or something deliberately. And in that sort of situation, it's hard to imagine just how long the data retention is because if that laptop is taken home today and it has 90 days worth of data on it, let's say, uh, and it ain't powered back on, and we're good now, and uh, it ain't powered back on and it gets lost or stolen, you know, it, it can be, you know, two, three years, or it can be six months later that someone pulls the drive, grabs all the data off of it, and you know, your data retention policy doesn't matter there because that data exists somewhere and it can be stolen during that window or without or, or outside that window depending on, you know, how uh, meticulous, I guess you would say, uh, data collectors are about handling that and for the most part I mean I don't have a lot of great experience on this but based on what I've seen they're not very meticulous about following those things uh, other business sort of interests get in the way uh, so anything else? yes Miss Deb Uh, like ad blocker or no script or um, I don't know if you saw the thing where you could opt out of the advertiser stuff with the digital advertising alliance so I don't, have you looked into any of those or would you recommend any of that kind of stuff links is awesome uh, 
in, in all seriousness, Ghostery, and, and this is made by one of the companies that sends out ads and collects data. So you know, in the future, it might you know not be as effective as it is today. It, it's pretty awesome stuff. It will block more things than whatever else you have. AdBlock Plus, yeah. AdBlock Plus and Ghostery will make your web browsing experience a hell of a lot better. Uh, yes, sir. So it's, uh, it's called disconnect.me, it's similar to some of these other things, but it's an ex-Google engineer and a privacy rights attorney got together and built this plugin for your browser. And it just, uh, it sort of tracks all the things that it's blocking for you and tells you all these social media things, all these tracking links and uh, clickbacks that just don't keep track of you anymore mm -hmm. because it blocks them. So it's a pretty good plugin. Well, thanks. I wasn't aware of disconnect.me. Uh, I'll check that out. Since I don't actually know about it, I'm not going to give them a plug right now, but something for your further edification. Figure it out. Uh, and when you get right down to it, we all have to figure it out as individuals. I mean, there, we've already gone over the idea that the group discussion stuff isn't great, so or the group action stuff is somewhat limited in what can be accomplished due to a lack of people who are actually interested. So those of us who understand the risk, who, who care about this sort of stuff, we all have to sort of figure it out ourselves. So uh, let's just move on along because let's see what time is it. Ooh, we're getting close. Against the middlemen, these are your ISPs, but not just ISPs. Think about your wireless carrier. Think about uh, your uh, satellite or cable TV provider. You know, these people are providing a service and they have a certain amount of data on you. Uh, your ISP, your wireless provider, obviously they have the most, but there are a lot of other sort of providers you can think of. Uh, encryption works, and I'll get more to this a little bit later on. Uh, if you wanted to be 100% anonymous, you'd have to use something like Tor, but against the middleman, we really don't care that much. They pretty much know when they see gigs of traffic going by at 8 p.m. that you're watching Netflix. You know, they know that. Um, they, are you really that worried that they know that you're going to Google or Facebook but don't know what you're putting up because it's an HTTPS connection? You know, those are things you have to decide for yourself. I would say I wouldn't worry that much about it uh, because that information, I guess you would say that metadata, uh, there's a good buzzword, uh, you know, not that important, but I think we can all agree that there might be times that it is. If you really worried about it, you can go with some sort of full encryption service like Tor, some sort of VPN. Something where even you know the IPs, who you're communicating with, gets encrypted. Uh, you, you can do that, but you know it's probably not needed as long as you're using some sort of endpoint to endpoint encryption. You know you're okay. So against the intelligent services, how do we you know foil the NSA? Once again, encryption works. The Snowden revelations show us time and time again that good, solid, non-encryption algorithms using decent keys are incredibly difficult for the NSA to hide. The greatest revelation is that the NSA doesn't have some sort of magic quantum computer that breaks everything all at once. I think we can all breathe a sigh of relief there. Uh, but if you look at how they uh, do things, like uh, Here's a good example. The FBI, when they went in and shut down the Silk Road, everybody know what the Silk Road is? Stoner. <laughs> uh, when they went in and shut down like the Silk Road, and they shut down a bunch of child pornography sites that were on these uh, dark nets or whatever you want to call them inside of the Tor uh, network, they went in and they put in, or they took over these sites and they put in some exploit code that exploited the Tor browser, which was based on some ancient Firefox uh, thing with Tor built into it. 
and it exploited a vulnerability in that browser. So they got to the content after it was decrypted and before it was encrypted in the first place on, on your browser's end. And they did that because they couldn't really break the encryption. If they could, it would take a massive amount of work to do it once, whereas it's a heck of a lot easier to attack this known vulnerability, exploit it everywhere, and get everything unencrypted. Uh, do we have a comment over here? Or? Okay, never mind. So if you if you want to, uh, you know, uh, deal with intelligence services, encryption works, and maintain your patches because that's where they attack. They don't really try and break your encryption. They try and break your box. Uh, the, again, the Snowden revelations show this time and time and time and time again. They have lists of exploits. They categorize them based on, you know, uh, how effective they are, uh, how well known they are, and you know, they they make logical choices as to which one we're going to use to attack this person based on their perceived threat level, uh, you know, the, the data they might could get, and you know, various things. And as long as you maintain patches, it's not perfect because they can have zero day stuff. And we're certain they have zero day stuff that we don't know about yet. And if they don't, they'll find some others. And if the NSA doesn't, then, you know, Chinese Secret Service will. Uh, FIS will, MI6 will, Mossad will, uh, Brazilian Secret Service, whoever they are, they're so secret we don't know them. Uh, you know, they'll find it. Mexico's drug cartels will find it. That's the Secret Service in Mexico. In fact, I think that's the only service in Mexico. Uh, and, you know, reduce exposure as much as possible. These, these are basic things. Firewalls, you know, do, you, do your basic security conscious stuff that you see everyone tell you to do and that we're all fairly lax on. Do those things and you're really, if not completely avoiding, you're, dr you're dramatically reducing your risk, you're mitigating the, uh, the problems. You know, but basically beating these people revolves down to using good sense. You know, encrypt what you, actually encrypt everything you possibly can because the last thing they want to see is you know she's going to Facebook and, and posting up you know all these pictures of her little doggy Toto and suddenly you know she's making some encrypted connection out to Iran we're interested in this lady you know uh, what what's in these bits and uh, y you know if you encrypt everything then there's no reason to look at this sort of data as more suspicious than that sort of data. And the more of us encrypt everything, the fewer keys they have to go on. And by keys, I don't mean encryption keys, I mean tails. Like, this guy's encrypting something, he's suspicious. You know, that's sort of the way it, it, it goes. And I'm sure they have things like, oh, we're connecting to Google, we're connecting to Facebook, and it's an HTTPS session. We're not interested in that. We're interested in all the other HTTPS sessions to the places that we don't know about. And uh, those, I'm sure we all make lots of those. We don't just go to Facebook, Google, or bank. You know, we don't just go to Amazon. We might go to some little small store here and there. And, you know, that's sort of a cue. This is suspicious behavior. They're encrypting something and it's not going to Facebook. You know, what could they be doing? That's suspicious. So, and I can't really read my last one because it scrolled off my laptop. Oh, always stay vigilant. That, that's the most important part. Uh, we, you know, we have a tendency to get lackadaisical or, or to get complacent with sort of things and, and I'm just as guilty as the next person this is why these tactics work so well people don't patch their machines is there anybody other than me still running Windows XP I love Windows XP now it's finally stable uh, they quit messing with it uh, 
So, but but you, you have to be vigilant about keeping all your patches, keep keeping everything maintained, about not doing stupid stuff because it's convenient and easy. You know, if if you maintain that vigilance, if you take it seriously, then you can you know greatly reduce your exposure. So. One of the last things we want to talk about is the world's greatest spy device. It's this little joker right here. And every one of us carries one. Who does not have a smartphone in here? One, two, three, four, five, five. That's suspicious. <laughs> Good man. <laughs> I, I, I don't know whether to be thrilled or, or whether to be disappointed or if they're just lying to me. Uh, but, you know, how, how many people don't have smartphones these days? How many kids have a smartphone these days? You know, at 14, 15, they get smartphones. And they carry their entire lives on these devices. Not just phone calls, not just the real-time GPS coordinates, not just their text, their email, their pictures, their videos, their browsing history, their social media, all their apps that they use, uh, their Snapchat stuff. Uh, you know, all in one convenient, easy to carry package that can be hacked, that can be swiped, that can be, you know, taken by the police and every bit of content downloaded on and hang, hand it back and they can browse through that stuff as it goes. There's actually a Supreme Court decision that we're either pending or you got a comment? No. Uh, that we were either pending for one or uh, it might have come down and I haven't noticed it yet about that specific practice. You get stopped for a traffic violation. Your tag is out of date. The police come, give me your smartphone, stick a thing in there, download all the data off of it for your entire life's history, hand it back to you. They store that data indefinitely, no warrant. They can stick it in a database, search through it as much as they want to, uh, no warrant. And this is, you know, what the Attorney General's Office of the United States is arguing this is the way it should be. Uh, and one, one of the greatest, or I suppose most depressing points about those arguments the Supreme Court had, I forget which justice it was, it wasn't Roberts, but it might as well have been, uh, said, I don't have a smartphone. I can't figure out how to unlock the dang thing. <laughs> this is the guy making a decision about how to use it. Uh, or about, you know, should this be susceptible to instant con... I'm sorry, what? You're going to have to speak up. I can't hear you. Scalia. It might have been. I ain't got no idea. I can't remember. It wasn't Sotomayor and it wasn't Kagan. And it wasn't Roberts. So that leaves you six. Well, Thomas doesn't talk, so. <laughs> that leaves you five. Thomas was too busy looking at pictures on his smartphone. <laughs> Whose pictures was he looking at? That's the question. But it's generally difficult to own one of these things and not give away personal information. I, I mean, the, 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 the real insidious nature of it is just how damn convenient it is. It's right here in your pocket. It's right here on your, on, in your purse or on your belt. And, you know, any information is right there at the touch of your fingertips. Da, 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 da. Yes, snakes are unable to close their eyes to sleep. Or dolphins keep one eye open while they sleep. Uh, manatee tastes wonderful. Uh, <laughs> You know, these are all, yeah, and it's right there at the touch of your fingertips. All your email, uh, the, uh, the, the married man having the affair with his, you know, on his wife, and, you know, his girlfriend sexed him some stuff right there on the phone. You know, world's greatest spy device. What do we do about this? Uh, I don't know who would ever do this, but... I would bow down and kiss the feet of any manufacturer that came out with something like a smartphone with a hardware switch that disconnected the power to the GPS device. You know, like on the side of your iPhone, you've got a switch that 
automatically turns off the ringer. You know, it's a hardware switch, clunk, it's off. You can't turn it on by, by software. Why not have something like that? Or like the laptop switches you often have, the hardware laptop switches that disable your wireless. On something like this? No. Yeah. Even if you turn off the GPS, the uh, the cell towers, you think at least your general area is known. Okay, his point was uh, even if you turn off the GPS, thanks to the cell towers, your general location is known. To that I say, there's only one cell tower where I live. So they only know in a pretty wide radius around that thing that someone's there. And uh, once you leave there, it's a long time before you pick up another one. Pull the SIM card. Yeah, pull the SIM card. Uh, that, that's not quite as much fun as throwing it into there and shooting it with a shotgun. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else got a comment? We're pretty much at you know the end here. I want questions and comments. This is meant to foster a public debate. This is meant to foster thought. This is meant to get everyone thinking about these things and talking about them. Yes, sir. That's a wonderful comment, uh, and I wish I had thought about that, that for this uh, thing. He said, you know, I've only focused on sort of like the digital stuff, but there's also the grandfather of all this, the credit bureaus, who collect all this data about us and keep it, and they own the data, not us, and it doesn't matter that it's about us, we don't have a say so in what it actually is, and if the data is incorrect, and they have it, it, they still maintain that it's correct. And the arbiters of that are the same people who had the data. So even if you prove it's incorrect, getting it changed is, you know, an act of Congress. And, you know, that's, that's a valid point. That's something we should con consider. And the, sub and the subject of the credit bureau, I mean, credit rating as well, um, they, their behavior algorithms, too, just like, you ever buy alcohol with a credit card, you're automatically flagged for financial risk. That's a good point. Uh, the credit card bureaus also have, you know, financial or uh, behavioral algorithms. So, you know, you buy alcohol with a credit card, you're flagged as a little bit more of a risk than someone who uses cash. Uh, that really wasn't a problem for me until I turned 21. <laughs> That's what I mean. I used cash before then. <laughs> yes, sir. Just a real quick comment on Facebook. Uh, there is a way to disable uh, the credit card bureaus. Uh, and it's called Facebook Bank. So if you can you can reduce that down to the bottom of the right, you can reduce that to the email. You have to prove it. Okay, so he was uh, wonderful. So his uh, comment was, you know, like specific to Facebook, where it's saying uh, we have these uh, controls, I guess, for who can and can't tag you. So you can say only these few people can tag me, and then when someone else tries to, it it sends an email to you, and that sounds like a great solution. But that solution can be changed tomorrow. Nothing stops Facebook from uh, doing that specifically. Yes, sir. The other thing about that, and I meant to say this before, I don't think I was perfectly clear, when I talked about Facebook, when I talked about Facebook begging you to tag people in their pictures, the sinister thing to me is they're using facial recognition software, they already know who it is. When my friend's wife, Christy, posts pictures of her family, she never tags her husband, and every time I see one of her pictures, it asks me, do you want to tag Kyle? 
And I'm like, well, if his wife didn't, why do I? But the point is, Facebook already knows. If, it, if they wanted to, tomorrow they could just start automatically tagging him. That's a fair point. I'm afraid this is all the time we've got for this discussion. So if you want to talk some more, you can find me later. Uh, bring, you know, alcohol. <laughs>